Welcome back, everyone. I cannot tell you how excited I am for this guest today. You know when you have those people that walk into your life and you're like, I just can't get enough of you. Every time you speak, every time you say something, like those words have weight, right? Um, for all my ladies or even men out there that have read Proverbs 31, the women that are the words that have weight. Like every time I, I hear that, I think honestly, not of the Proverbs 31 woman, let me just declare that for Humberto, but the words with weight, um, that is something that definitely resonates with me. Um, this gentleman has had a huge impact on my life and how we met was through the channels of social media, just you start getting to know people, they get to know people. And I think he met my brother-in-law first or something like that. And then we all ended up connecting. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to really be able to have social media, bring people into your life that are there for the rest of your life and really bring good meat and fruit to your life. And honestly, um, I could not even give the, the it proper justice for just how grateful I am for Humberto, who is our guest today. Um, he is an extraordinary pastor out of San Antonio, Texas. I'm going to let him share his bio with you. Um, and we'll get to a little bit later on just one of the most impactful moments that he's had on my life, just from the environments that he cultivates um, and just the, the deepening of my relationship with the Lord I've been able to have because of this man. So Humberto, we are so excited to have you on the show. I know this is going to be a rocking podcast for men and women. So ladies, if you're listening to this, share this with your man or a guy that you know, because they are definitely going to want to hear this too. Um, but I would love for you to be able to share a little bit about yourself, your story. So please take it away and share more. Let's go. Well, Molly, I am super excited to be part of this. This is an amazing already platform to impact and to influence uh, so many other people. And I'm excited to be part of it. You know, I'm a I'm a homegrown young kid from a small town from of Uvalde, Texas, uh, which really recently made it on the map, right, all across the world with just uh, crazy news out there. But um, grew up there, and now I am in San Antonio, Texas, where I have my beautiful wife, Leslie, my two kids, Micah and Arabella, and third baby girl on the way. So that's exciting. Uh, and then I get to do a bunch of fun stuff. I get to lead pastor one of the most phenomenal churches in San Antonio, Revive Church San Antonio. Um, and we are planting our second campus in Uvalde, Texas now in my hometown. Uh, so aside from all that, pastoring, leading, we also have something called the church leader where I'm equipping and training other leaders, pastors. You know, I oversee other uh, campuses, oversee other other pastors and their churches and just get to be part of some of the most influential, impactful, um, just moves of God all over the world. And then we got stuff going on in Mexico and in Peru and Colombia. And so not only do I get to be part of it in our, in here in the U.S., in our English speaking community, but also impact internationally, porque también somos Latinos, right? So we are Latinos. Uh, and so it, it, it's been a beautiful season for sure. So and I get to do fun stuff like this and meet incredible people like you. So let's do this. Oh, gosh, I love it. And, you know, the part that I love, too, is, you know, when we were talking, it's like we could be on this for hours and go down a lot of different rabbit holes. But one of the things that really spoke to me before we jumped on, I was like, OK, Lord, like, what do you want to say? This is yours. This is your platform. You asked me to open it up. You got stuff to say. Let's say it. Um, and then he really spoke leadership for men. Obviously, I talk a lot of leadership for women. And so ladies, if you're listening to this, this is going to be so valuable for you too, because obviously you have men in your life, right? Like this is so key because honestly, I mean, you could probably go a million miles with this, wherever you want to go, I'm, I'm here for it. Um, but just, there's been such an attack on men and leadership of men. And like, how do you see that just being obviously a man yourself, a father, a husband, a son, um, you know, a pastor, a leader? You know, just that attack on men, like I would really um, just in the leadership that is so needed. And that's where I really would love to go. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because they need it too. A lot of women are coming together, but men need it just as much as we do. Right. No, and I think that, you know, the the male or the man, let me, let me begin by saying this, just because you're a male doesn't make you a man. And just because you're a man doesn't make you a husband. And just because you have kids doesn't make you a father. I think that the male, uh, you know, persona, the, the male figure in a home is one of the most, probably the most important thing to have in the home. You know, God, by his divine nature, gave man, 
you know, just the chromosomes to decide the identity or the sex of a child. Like we carry that chromosome, whether it's going to be male or female, but not just that we also carry the language or the voice that's going to speak into the identity of a son or a daughter. You know, the male figure, the father figure is, is the most crucial entity on the earth because uh, God has given us the responsibility, right? To steward a family, to steward a marriage, to steward um, a business and, and opportunity and finances. And we have that, that, that responsibility, you know, from the beginning, God chose a guy named Adam, gave him an instruction, right? And through disobedience, right? We know that they ate of the forbidden tree. They did all this, but Adam above all had the responsibility to number one, guard the garden and guarding the garden for a man can signify so many things, right? Guarding the garden means that you're, you're not only protecting and guarding your family, your wife, your children, but you're also guarding it from anything else that wants to infiltrate your garden and eat your garden, right? You have the responsibility to steward your garden, your Eden well, so that nothing outside of God's purpose penetrates or enters or breaches your garden. You have a responsibility to make that garden grow flourish and not just sustain you it's sustaining your wife it's sustaining your children it's sustaining generations to come and many people get stuck at at that place many men get stuck at that place because we're raised in a very fatherless generation so rather than raising sons we're raising orphans we're raising people that have no direction people that are wandering they don't know their purpose they don't know why they exist and it's truly because we never had a male figure or a father figure speak that identity or that life into us. And so therefore we are in a garden and we're misplaced. We're in purpose, but we don't know what purpose looks like because we've never had purpose taught to us. And so now many men find themselves, um, you know, just hustling and trying hard and, and grinding when in actuality, nothing was supposed to be like that. Adam wasn't wasn't meant to hustle the garden. He wasn't meant to grind in the garden. He wasn't meant to wake up and just work, work, you know, work that thing. It was, he had a responsibility to guard, to protect, to shelter. Now, because of the fall, because of sin, now everything that was working with you is not working against you. You know, that's what happened with Adam. That's what happened with the soil. In other words, at one point, the soil and the land was working with Adam alongside Adam, but because of sin, because of the fall, now everything that was working with him now began to work against him. Now Adam had to sweat right through the sweat of his brow, and, and now everything that was producing was be producing because of his work. All that to say is the man has one of the most crucial responsibilities on the earth to guide, to protect, to, to speak into the identity of his of his children and also speak life into their spouse into their wives right i like to tell men this if you don't like the harvest you're receiving change the seed you sow seed of discord you sow seed of disagreement you sow seed of anger and and bitterness and offense and you bring down your wife well, of course you're not going to like the harvest you're getting you know your wife is your garden and if you don't feed the life into it you're going to you're going to get the consequences of those of those words of those actions so um the male has just one of the greatest responsibilities to uplift uh has the that's why you know god naturally made us uh the way you know we're more muscular we got more testosterone right we're able to produce more in that in that arena but the male figure just in any area in leadership in guiding in and being able to sustain a family it's it's it is one of the most crucial yet the most attacked area in the world, you know? So men got to, got to raise up for sure. Gosh. And you see why I like, you see why I love Humberto? Like that was just so good. I'm sitting there like, yes, yeah, so good. Give me more, give me more. And I'm not joking. Every time he talks, I am like that in his presence. I'm like, gosh, oh, it's so good. Because what you don't see is the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, the wisdom, the sitting in God's presence, the really just absorbing and really just drilling down deep. And yes, of course, you know, he's a pastor, but even beyond that, you could just tell that there's a passion and just a deep, like, I want to, I want to know more. And that's what something I value so much with you. So, oh my gosh, all of that is so good. I would, the phrase that came up in my mind is, for the men out there, obviously you said, like you said, the, the weight is, it's heavy. The responsibility mm -hmm. is heavy. I mean, it was on you. You were first. 
And so there's a lot of men out there and men, give me, give me a little bit of grace as I say this. And I promise I'm going somewhere. You know, there's a lot of men out there that have that victim mindset because they didn't have that example. They didn't have that, like they didn't, they don't know. They just don't know. They didn't have that environment, that community. And I'm not saying that to come down on you guys, please hear me what I say. How do they go from victim to victor? Because if they didn't have a father example, if they didn't have the right environment, community, pastor, church, you know, all of that, how can they make that shift of like, okay, I don't, everything you just said, I'm kind of in that bucket and I don't like what I'm sowing. So how can I shift from victim to victor? Yeah, I think that is number one, realizing that, you know, everything is a mentality that you choose to have. Like you don't have, you don't get to choose what family you were raised in right? You don't get to choose the environment you were born into. Um, so that's not your choice. You're just born into it. So I didn't get to choose my parents. I don't get to choose what city I'm born in. I don't get to choose even my name. It, it all came to me, right? The only thing I get to choose is how I steward what was given to me. And as a man, you have the responsibility to either choose the life that you were given and steward it and, and make it the best that you can make it by, by using your life experiences, right? You don't get to choose whether your dad was present or not. You don't get to choose whether you were raised in the barrio or in Beverly Hills. Like you don't get to choose if you were born in, in LA or born in San Antonio. I don't get to choose that. The only thing I get to steward is what comes my way. Like, I don't get to choose the thoughts that come my way. I can only choose the thoughts that I allow to stay. Mm. And so if I choose the victim mentality, the orphan spirit, the, the wandering spirit, the thing that's that's like, okay, all these attacks, why am I getting attacked? Well, you have a responsibility to say, hey, either I let the attacks make me a victim or I'm going to choose these things. I'm going to allow these things to be the training ground for me to become everything that God's called me to be, right? Every single one of us, like we have to understand like crisis and tribulation and testing does not discriminate. It comes to everyone. All of us get tested. All of us get, get hardships. All of us, life is not easy just because, uh, you know, you're, you're white, black, brown or whatever it we all it does not discriminate we all get hit the difference is how i choose to pivot how i choose to use the life experiences that i have to either steward my my life well um you know i didn't i wasn't raised in a rich home i was actually as a matter of fact i look back and i'm like wow we were really poor um, I did not know that, you know, my parents couldn't pay $200 a month of rent, right? I didn't know like <clears throat> that my dad was hustling, trying to work, trying to work three jobs. And, and me as a kid, anytime I asked my parents for something, you know, at their best of their ability, they gave me what I could, what, what they could offer me. But when I go back and I think I was like, wow, like I was really poor. Like my parents, I, I remember my parents living on food stamps and, and, and trying to, my dad trying to make more money just so that we can have more, you know, but I grew up, I was like, I never had an, a Nintendo. I never had a lot of the, the stuff my son has right now. I'm kind of jealous. Cause I'm like, I never ever had this. Like, and so I think that now we have a responsibility to be able to steward our lives and to use our life experiences as stepping stones. Now, if you don't have it at home, find it, right? If you don't have a father figure, find it. Like there should be something, an internal desire to say, man, I need a father. I need a mentor. I need someone that has been there, done that, that can take me to that place. We have to understand there's always somebody already that came out of the place you're believing God to take you out of. And there's somebody already standing in the place you're believing God to take you to. And so when you understand that, there's mentors and people and voices all over the world that you can glean on. And even though I didn't have um, a father, right. Or, or that whoever's listening, right. Can say, man, I didn't have that growing up or I didn't have this or life wasn't just, you know, served on a silver platter. Of course it wasn't, but I have a responsibility to say, Hey, even though it wasn't, doesn't mean I can't go find it. Right. It exists. It's out there. And so it's important for a man to humble himself, to remain teachable, Find the people that are going to speak life into those areas of, of your life and take you out of the place that you're believing God to take you out of. So mm, that's so good. And I have, uh, I was writing down two different notes because I didn't, there's so many thoughts going through my mind. I'm like, which direction do we want to go? So I want two different things, but I want to start here. You're talking about how obviously we all get dealt with different trials and tribulations and circumstances. 
was there a circumstance or a time in your life where it could have really shifted you for the worse, but actually turned out for the better because you let it develop you to who you are today? Is there a time that you could share with us to kind of give a little context about you? Oh, 100%. Um, I think I would have to say it was my sophomore year of college. Um, you know, I'm going in, I'm about 20 years old, I think around that time. Um, and I and I was already in ministry. I'm I'm already leading. I'm actually the president of a ministry on campus at Texas State University, and um, I just went through a very very tough mental like crisis in that in that stage of my life where I've never been hit like that. So I knew it was a it was truly a demonic assault against my purpose, against my assignment. Um, to the point where it's like, man, I wanted just to throw everything away. Like I said, God, I'm done with this. Like I'm not gonna be serving you and and be going through this type of pressure like I, you didn't tell me that this is what I was going to have to go through to get to what you've called me to do and all that to say is you know by the grace of God I have a father that that loves me and and I remember my dad looked at me he's like son I need you to sit down for a year like you're not going to do ministry I don't want you leading I don't want you I need you to be a healthy leader and when he told me that I was like what do you mean he's like I don't want you doing anything I want you to sit down you're going to, you're just simply going to go into a season of receiving and getting healed and getting healthy. Wow. And man, for a whole year, like I went from being at the peak of what I could call the peak of, of ministry, you know, I'm 19, 20 years old, I'm leading, you know, hundreds of, of young people on my college campus to Jesus, I'm leading small groups, everyone looks at me for the, I'm the guy, you know, in that sense, like I'm the leader that, there's all this pressure. And then suddenly that leader is now sitting down doing nothing for a year because I needed healing. And so I go through that process, probably the most, I mean, even physically, I started breaking out in hives. I was under so much pressure of just life that I was like, God, like I never saw this coming. I wanted to quit school. I wanted to move back home. Like there was just so much going on. And so all that to say is I went through my process I've encountered Jesus in a way that I'd never have before. Um, I always take my life back to that moment of being in my room, crying out to the Lord, saying, Lord, I need you more now than ever. Like you either heal me or or that's it. I don't know what else to do. So I always go back to that moment. And um, it was that moment of pressure. And there's nothing like growing under pressure because the only way to truly get the oil for your next level is to be squeezed, right? There's things that God will bring out of you. There's things that God will squeeze out of you. And when you go under the squeezing hand of God, it's not going to kill you. It's just producing what you didn't know was sitting on the inside of you. So all of us is like that grape, right? That has to go under pressure to get wine. It's like that olive that has to go under pressure to get oil. We all are made of substance on the inside of us that can only be birthed under pressure. So thank God for the pressure. Mm. <laughs> Oh, that is so good. And that, that squeezing is not, it's not going to be the, the most fun of times, but when you look back on it, I remember, you know, when I was going through a squeezing season of my own, I was like, this is the absolute worst. Like, I feel like my flesh was melting off. I was like, Lord, what is going on? I've never heard anybody go through it before. They talk about it here and there, but no one has ever really spoken out loud about it. Um, and when you go through it, you feel like you're all alone. You're like, oh my gosh, like what is actually, what is actually happening? And so when the Lord brought me through that, I started getting vocal about the season I just went through and people are like, is this normal? Is this normal? I'm like, people don't talk about this. Like, this is actually kind of crazy, or at least I've never really heard of it, uh, which blows my mind because I know I'm sure so many people around me have gone through that squeezing season to where I trust me all, like there's definitely going to be episodes on that because I know there's people, especially now with what the Lord's doing, like there's going to be a lot more squeezing happening, but I appreciate your vulnerability because I couldn't even imagine as a leader of doing all that, going from a thousand to zero and sitting down, prioritizing your healing and then feeling like, you know, you're just absolutely losing all control because what the Lord's trying to refine you in. So um, I love that. I love that you shared that because it's, we all have those seasons and we can come on here being like, oh, you know, just I can speak to this and this and this, but you guys, like at the end of the day, he's, he's still human. Sometimes yeah. I'm shocked. I'm like, are you sure you're human? Because like the way <laughs> that you speak, I'm like, there's no way, <laughs> but there's a lot of really great relatability in there. So thank you. Um, another question that I have from what you were sharing earlier is you mentioned when you were growing up, you didn't know you were poor till later, your parents having troubles, you know, paying $200 in rent. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, your son now has way more than you ever had. <laughs> Clearly there was a shift in you of, you know what, like you obviously I've been around you and your parents, you love them dearly. You guys are all super close, but you didn't want that life for yourself. And you decided to shift and change. Why was that? What happened? Like, talk about that right there, because you could have been the same product of that environment, not saying that it's bad or whatever, but obviously you and your wife do very well for yourself. There's a lot of great things that you guys are doing in ministry, outside of ministry. And so that shift of doing something different for your family, I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, I think I think you hit it right on the head. Like one is a product of their environment, right? And if you stay in that environment, you'll become, it's like, you can be a great fish and and it doesn't matter if you don't have the resources to sustain, right? Your growth, you will, you essentially plateau, you'll cap at the level of your environment. Um, I, I go back to when I was 18 years old, um, my parents and all our family are taking a trip up to New York for the first time. I'd never been out of Uvalde, like, and we're going to New York. How does that work? we were going with other friends long story short that trip gets canceled the day before we're completely like i'm i'm upset i'm like man like this didn't work out i knew it wasn't gonna work out like nothing ever works out good for us you know type type mentality long story short we end up just making a trip to houston uh which is only a few hours away from ubaldi and we went to houston and all the money that we had to spend in new york we ended up spending it in houston and i I go there and I had some friends on MySpace and I just back in that time. Right. So you could, you could date it back, but I reach out and I'm like, yo guys, what's up? We'd never met, you know, cause you don't meet people on social media until you're in their city or whatever. And I said, Hey, I'm in Houston. Let's, let's hook up. Let's, let's meet up. So they invited me over to a concert, me and my sisters, we end up going at the end of the concert, we all go out to eat. And there's a gentleman, I have no idea who he is. He comes up to me and he's like, who are you? And I was like, you know, I'm Humberto. I'm from a little small town uh, in, in Uvalde, Texas. And man, we're just here for a week just to vacate. He's like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, do you mind if I take you out? And I said, no, I don't, I don't mind, you know? So ends up taking us out to eat. Um, and that whole week, he treated me and my family with the utmost like honor. And he just simply said, man, I don't know what it was, but when I shook your hand, God told me to take care of you. Wow. And he ended up moving us from a holiday in like little holiday in. Cause that's all we got. Right. He moved us into the center of like Westheimer Galleria area of Houston, put us in the, one of the best hotels. We had this massive suite, my parents. And I'm like, who is this guy? And by the end of the night, by the end of the week, I mean, we had experienced so much that I'd never, I've never seen a bill over a hundred dollars, you know, for food. And this guy's out here spending six, $700 on us and my family didn't know who he was by the end of everything. He tells me the Lord told me to take care of you, um, for the rest of your life. Like literally like, and I didn't know. And he's like, man, I'm a, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I make millions of dollars a year. And the Lord just really put on me to take care of you and your family. And he was the first millionaire I ever met. And I still was still friends till today. He <clears throat> helped me break the poverty mindset off of us. He helped me break that poverty spirit. And that's what allowed us to kind of excel when a thousand dollars was like the end of the world for us. Now we're talking, you know, million dollar projects and, you know, I need, I need 10 million for this, for this next, you know, there's just, there's this cap that just breaks and, 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 I, and I guess I can say it like you are a product of the people you hang out with. If you change the language, you'll change your mind. If you change your mind, you'll change your life. Like that's just how it works. And so from there, I just made a decision never to go back to that place. And we've never been back uh, by the grace of God, but my son will never be able to experience that because he's, he has everything. My daughter has, has everything that they need. Um, so it's my responsibility just, just as, just to set them on a platform because they're not going to begin where I begin. They're going to begin where I leave off. And that's called inheritance. That's what fathers leave. And so that's what happened in my life. And it's just been a constant like relational equity with people that help take you to another level each and every year. Mm. Oh, that's so good. And what a, I mean, obviously what a blessing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden this person out of obedience doesn't know you from Adam and was like, Hey, you know, I'm going to do this thing. and didn't share with like, didn't share later until 
by the way, the Lord told me this. Yeah. And, you know, people can do that now, but I think there's probably so much of that, but they're like, oh, this person's going to think I'm crazy when really you're the blessing that they've been praying for and the Lord wants to use you. And so um, that's just such an amazing example of just, you know, obviously things shifted and changed. You were bummed at first and then you left that trip forever yeah. changed. And like, we're going to do things differently because you're able to see things differently. Um, and I can so resonate with that to a point where, you know, when I was young, a lot of my, just the way that, um, I just knew I was different growing up. Like I was just like, okay, Lord, I just feel different, but I don't want to be different. I want to hang out with my friends. And he's like, you can try, but I've created, I've built you differently. Um, but I just always knew I'm like, I don't want to settle for that. I don't want to settle for that. I've had this non, like no settle mentality for the longest time. And, um, that's why I became a news anchor and reporter. Cause I'm like, who does that? Nobody, but that sounds fun. Um, so I always would get into other things and settle or not settle, excuse me. And then just eventually when I got older, I just kept start hearing the same conversations around me. I'm like, I don't like these. And then I had to actually go find people personally online to go follow and then reverse engineer. How did they get there? Their mindset, their business or this than that um, entrepreneurs specifically. And so um, you may not have these people around you. You may not, you may go on vacation. You may not have what Humberto had happened to him, but there's so many opportunities we're in such an opportunity rich environment with the scarcity mindset mentality of, oh, that's not for me. That's for somebody else. Oh, I don't think I can do that because the enemy has you just trapped in disbelief that it's not for you or bringing in people that you love around you, pouring into you. You can't have that. You can't do that because if you do, then that makes them kind of check themselves. Uh, but I love the fact that that story happened to be a family event. And it wasn't like okay. a one-off. So then everybody got to experience that because I'm sure obviously that shifted and changed for you. And if I went to every single one of your family members that was on that vacation, you probably have all different stories, but all probably super impactful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, you know, one of the most beautiful things is that I always go back to that place, which allows me now to be that for someone else. Like I've had so many of my buddies just come and hang out with me here in San Antonio. And they're like, bro, you don't know what that weekend spending with you did to me. You know, you don't know what that just being around that in your home, right? Just sitting there listening and you don't know that you broke the the spirit of poverty, the spirit of limitation. You broke that off of me. And I feel like that's even a grace now that I have as to break and unlock people's capacity and say, hey, there's so much more than this. You know, there's so much more, but it's just that that product of being in an environment that just starts breaking things off of you that you didn't know. But it's just a moment for God. You know, it's one moment that begins to unlock your future. So mm. it's beautiful now. I love that. And when he says that people come into his home and those conversations happen, I, I definitely can speak truth to that because I've done that where, I mean, um, for anybody that's been following me for a number of years, you guys know my bedtime is like, once it gets dark, Molly goes to bed. I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. Like we're up and we're drinking coffee and what's the Mexican bread called? I always butcher it. Uh, you're talking about the conchas? Yes, conchas. conchas. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just like, what are we? And then I was like, wait a second, it's like 1 a.m. I got to go to bed. But when you are in it, you're like, I don't, does, like time just slips away because you're so just like enthralled of like, wow, I've never been here before. And that's what I really love when it comes to community in that right environment, right? And you do such a great job of cultivating that in your church, your friends, your family, anybody that walks into your home, that your home feels like, their home because you make it so comfortable for, for guests to come over. Um, and so it's just such a beautiful thing because we're really made for that community. And I would even love to kind of even trail off on that topic for a little bit because community, we hear it all the time and we can be in community. I'll put the air quotes around it, but it's really, nothing's happening. Nothing's going on. You truly have unlocked such great, rich community where people have breakthroughs and just transformations and, and generational curses literally breaking off in your home, in your church, everywhere. I would love to know, like, if there is a, what is it? Or like how you've been able to cultivate that. I'd love to hear more on that. Yeah. I think community is, is what you build around your values, right? It's the culture that you sustain. Um, culture is built over time, right? Of intentionality, consistency, and so we, even as a church, you know, we're, we're sustained by values and those values go a long way, especially when it comes to building the community. But I always said this, I was like, can we build a community that's worth being a part of, you know, can we build a community that people actually would want and like to die for? Like, I want to be part of this. And I build Revive as, as the best church in San Antonio, because it's the church that I would want to attend 
if I wasn't the pastor, you know, I want to be there. I want to be present. I want to be. And so from coming from that mentality, I said, man, can we build a house for God where people come and they encounter him and only him, you know, this isn't built around a man, around a pastor, around a gift, around a charisma. It's truly built around the presence of God. And so when people come and they encounter him, they're like, man, I've never encountered it like this before, where now I encounter him, but it's sustained through community. It's sustained because we're all having the same encounters with God. And so all of us together are encountering the same God. We're hearing his voice and we're doing some awesome stuff. Like we just obey. So we say, we'll seek, we'll hear, and then we obey God and then we'll see what life does. And so it's beautiful when all of you have the same goal, the same the same vision, you're going after him. And that helps sustain the community all the way around. And so you get the people that are not just there present in your life, but they're there to speak on behalf of God into your life and vice versa. Like, I want to hear what you have to say about God, right? And and I hope that you want to hear about what I have to say. But then the other beautiful part is like, hey, I see God doing this in you and then vice versa. You see God doing something in me. And community, it just grows and it's becoming just a beautiful thing to be a part of. I love that. And it's, I mean, it really is like, I mean, it's together. Like you said, it's not built around a man. It's not built around a gift. It's built around the presence and that presence you know, how God designed it is like, we get to all learn from each other, pour in, pour out. It's not a depletion. It's not a check it off the list. And, you know, I've had the opportunity of being able to come to your church and I wish it was a lot closer because I will tell you, I don't know if I could actually sit in any other service where they are translating from Spanish to English and they, it's still, you just feel it so heavy and so thick and you look around and you just see people on their knees and just, I mean, it, they are in it and it's not, it's not for show. It's not fake. It's, it's real. And it's, it's that it's what people really are seeking. They want that real. Um, and you've done such a great job cultivating that. It's so good. Um, I want to take a second here, uh, before we wrap up in just a little bit of, I want to share with people such a encounter that I had because of you and the community and the culture that you've cultivated. So how long have we known each other? Like a couple of years? Yeah, I would say a couple of years. I think we met maybe 2021. Um, so yeah, a couple of years now. Something so, like that. Yeah. We've, we've known each other for a couple of years. So I believe maybe if we met in 2021, this must've been the beginning of 2022 then. Yeah. Um, so we, again, I think he, you met my brother-in-law, we ended up, you know, chatting, coming together, talking, um, my mother-in-law since moved in 2021 out to Texas. So when we go out there, we always try to, you know, hang out. If you come over here to California, we always <laughs> hang out. Um, but there was a time where he was in the beginning of the year, I believe it was in 2022, running a fast in the beginning of the year. And I was like, okay. And this is 5 a.m. Texas time. And I live in California. And if you don't know this, I wake up very early. So that's 3 a.m. my time. I'm already up. I do my quiet time with the Lord. Then I go to the gym. So I'm like, yes, I want to do this fast. I've never really been a part of a, a true fast before. I just never really felt that pull, but I felt that pull this time around. Cause I just knew there's, I've always known there's something different about you. And I just, I like being around just what it is that you bring. So anyways, this is over zoom, lots of amazing things happen. And in this time, I'm just feeling the Lord starting to break things off. And, mm -hmm. um, I remember being on this call and the Lord's like, we're going to, I think we're only halfway through it. The Lord's like, we're going to throw it all away. What is all of it? I had had um, an addiction to marijuana for 10 years. I didn't even see it as an addiction. Actually. I didn't see it as something that was an issue. It was just something I did just to kind of, at the end of the day, chill out, kind of come down a little bit. Always told myself I was high strung, like always just was so whatever. I gave myself all the excuses, right? I can fill in the gaps. But I just heard so clearly, it's time to get rid of it. And I was like, whoa, because on that call, prior to him telling me that I had never truly, I couldn't recall any experience that vivid of me hearing so clearly from the Holy Spirit. And I was like, I don't ever want this to stop. I never want this to stop. So because I'm like, I never want this to stop. He's like, all right, well, we got to get rid of all this. And I was like, okay. So then right after your call, I basically go to the gym, shower, get ready for the day. I pack up everything, hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. And the apartment we were living at the time, I put it down the trash chute and I was recording myself on the way to the garbage. I'm like, this is going to be used somewhere. I just knew it. I didn't know when I was honestly embarrassed to tell anybody because even people that I did tell that I would smoke marijuana, they're like, what you, you don't look like a stoner. And I'm like, you know what? We don't all have to be stoners. Like it, it can be for a lot of different things. 
So anyways, um, end up throwing all that away and hadn't touched it since. And it was so freeing. It was a cold turkey, like just get, get rid of it, right? Um, what the Lord ended up revealing to the, me, for, first of all, he honored that. And I've been able to hear him more clearly than ever before that I never even want to go back and touch it because I don't, I, I'm terrified. The fear of the Lord is where I'm terrified to cut off that communication with him because that is more valuable than anything. Then the breath in my lungs, like I want to hear what he has to say. So I got rid of that. Um, it wasn't until a year later that I actually publicly shared it because I held a lot of shame from it. I held a lot of shame from it. There was a lot of like, okay, like I'm a, a co-founder and owner of a, a network marketing company that's Christian values. Like a lot of women look up to me. If they knew, what would that do? And I said, you know what? That is definitely the enemy's trying to speak into me saying, you're going to lose everything if you share. And I was like, I bet you I won't. So I shared it and I'm not really on TikTok that much. And I just happened to put on TikTok. That sucker went viral like that. And the amount of comments that were in that, the only reason I share this is because it's not for me and vanity purposes. The amount of healing that you read in those comments of people saying, I was about ready to pick up a joint. I was about ready to pack a bowl. I was about ready to smoke and watch this thing. And I instantly was like, I think this is for me to stop. Hundreds and hundreds and hun probably thousands actually at this point. And I was just like, oh Lord. You know, yeah. because something that the Lord broke off of me, it seemed like in an instant, but he'd been working up to it, right? Like nothing is yeah. ever just, boop, there it is to, to see that, to help other people break free of addiction and come to find out I, it masked a lot of anxiety. It actually uh -huh. damaged my dream life for a number of years. Um, I had very terrifying dreams, basically my whole life. I never actually had peaceful sleep. I didn't realize that until after I stopped. I was being demonically attacked in my dreams, my entire, it was always something terrifying, chasing me, something horrible happening. It took me a whole year to pray over that and to repair that. I didn't know until I stopped. But the reason all of this even happened is because the experiences that I had being in the right environment, choosing to wake up three o'clock in the morning, being on somebody who lives like 2000 miles away. He just happens to run a fast with his church. I'm not a part of that church. And I said, I want to be a part of it. He's like, yeah, come on in. And it was in that instance, what was cultivated in the encounter in that environment that I was able to be like, we're done. Mm -hmm. And then be able to openly share that and then have that be, you know, guidance for other people of look, if I can, you can, because there's so many crutches that are out there that are hindering what God really wants to show and speak to you, but you're so dependent on something else because you feel like that's the only way because that's what's normalized. Yeah. So that's a huge, um, just, I mean, blessing in my life because of who you are, what you've done way before I even met you to being able to be on that call, to have that experience, to have this ripple effect. And I'm sure it's just going on and on. We have no idea. Yeah. You know, you know, one day when we get to heaven, the Lord may reveal it to us. of like, here's what happened. But because of all those obedience pieces lining up, that's where I'm just like, I, first of all, Humberto, I cannot wait to have you on my podcast because I know it's just going <laughs> to be absolute gold. But I couldn't let this podcast stop without sharing that because that's such an impactful moment in my life wow. because of the community you've created just who you are, what you've been able to cultivate. Um, and I know you've heard this story in various forms before, but I'm like, the world needs to know, or whoever's listening to this podcast, yeah. it needs to know because you never know when you come across somebody and they're going to have such a dramatic impact on your life. Because for me, that was a massive, massive moment. Wow. And I think it's beautiful. I think what makes it so beautiful is the fact that you realize that your freedom was attached to a decision you had to make, right? And there's so many that get um stuck right and stagnant in their life because they're not willing to make that decision i've always said deliverance and freedom is not necessarily when you get you know this you know when you get set free from demons it, it's actually a decision it's a decision to want what god wants for you so it's you saying god i want what you want for me so now let me make that decision and if there's stuff that i gotta lay down then i'll lay it all down you know but i want what you have for me and so for many, that's where people get stuck because they're not, they're unsure about almost as if God doesn't know what's best for them. So let me just stay attached to my dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And and now, you know, now you're just a dysfunctional uh, entrepreneur, you're a dysfunctional leader, you're a dysfunctional husband, you're a dysfunctional uh, father, you know, you're just dysfunctional because you've gotten so used to dysfunction that anything outside of dysfunction, any healthy environment makes you, makes you tremble. Like it makes you it makes you fold. And so I've seen it with so many people that they get around a healthy environment like revive and they just, they just don't, they cannot live in that environment. And the truth is they've, they've only experienced dysfunction. They've only experienced their, 
their trauma and their pain and their addictions and all the stuff that when there's a place to get free, they don't know how to accept mm -hmm. it. They don't know how to receive it. And so for you, you know, I think, and for many others probably hearing, you know, are either stuck, stagnant or, or bound to an addiction or, or trying to get free from something. But I want to say this, like all it takes is you making a decision to want what God wants for you. And now Molly, you know, how do I know it's genuine? Because you've sustained the freedom, you know, you've sustained, but you've also sustained the presence. Like you didn't just get rid of this and not replace it. Now you replaced it with his voice. You replaced it with his presence. You replaced it with spending more time with the Lord. And now the Lord begins to unlock the real destiny that's inside of you. Cause there's no more hindrances. Mm, that's so good. It's, and you're right. There's so much dysfunction that's out there and we normalize it. So when people have freedom that we're just like, this doesn't seem right. And we're seeing that all in the world. It's like, yeah. bad has become good. Good has become bad. Like things are just so wild everywhere. And, you know, we just, we recognize the times we recognize the season that we're in and the best place to be is not running to the bottle, not running to, we not running to multiple partners or whatever you're shopping, running off an Amazon account. I mean, whatever <laughs> that is for you, like packages every day, yeah. um, it's running into his presence. And so I get people all the time again, like, how do you get up so early? I'm like, when you start to find your spot where, you know, nothing else is going to hinder between you and the Lord. And for me, I have to go park somewhere where there's nobody else, no distractions. I get distracted very easily. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> and then when I'm set in that, it's like, oh my gosh, like my cup is over, it's oozing. It's like, it's just the most amazing feeling. And it didn't start that way. It took actually probably a good year and a half to really get that down because it, it started with a lot of like, Lord, I need this and I want this. And why are you doing this? Like, and just used him as a wishing well until I'm like, all right, I sound like a brat right now. And this is not how this works. So let's actually... <laughs> <laughs> press yeah. in and instead of being on the milk, let's get into the meat, right? And getting into the meat and potatoes of your um, salvation and really just understanding your relationship with the Lord. It takes work, it takes a lot of dying to self. For me, it takes really early mornings, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So um, gosh, Humberto, this is like, oh, this is gold. <laughs> I mean, I could have you on, I probably will, multiple different episodes, but I just appreciate your time coming in and pouring out. You do so much pouring into other people and I know people are going to listen to this and be blessed. So we're going to have all his information um, inside of uh, just the comment and the um, just the section below description. So you can be able to connect with him. Um, you know, if you feel led to, to tie to him, to support him, if you're in San Antonio or anywhere near in Texas, go visit him. I promise you're going to absolutely love it. Um, it's just amazing. And so I just appreciate you being able to come on, pour out, just share so much wisdom. I'm thinking like, Lord, you're going to have to come up with the title for this one. Cause we talked about so many good things that I don't <laughs> even know, but by the time somebody's listening to this, there's going to be a title already, but it's just yeah. so good that my cup is definitely full. And I hope that yours is too. Um, but before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd love to leave us with today? Man, you know, I mean, there's so much, right. That we could, that we could say even now, but I would say this, you know, God, God's intention for us is so much greater than what we see for ourselves. And God deposits inside of each and every one of us so much uh, gold, so much value. And we have to understand that sometimes life will, I like to call it demonic debris. Sometimes life will throw so much dirt at you. And if you interpret the dirt as your enemy, you'll always feel like it's the worst thing for you. But when you understand that you've been a seed planted on this earth, you'll understand that the dirt is always necessary. You know, the, the dirt serves its purpose and it's to cultivate the seed that's sitting on the inside of you. So whatever life has thrown at you, whatever life has brought to you, guard the garden, cultivate the seed and give birth to everything that the Lord has put inside. Give birth to the vision and do not let anything paralyze what God has deposited inside of you as a person, as a leader, as a husband, as a father, as a wife, whatever it may be, give birth to the thing sitting on the inside of you and watch God receive the glory for all that's been birth through you oh gosh that is so good and you just gave me my title guard the garden perfect i was like i know it's there gonna come go. on through <laughs> there it is there it is but thank guard you so garden. much truthfully this has been absolutely incredible y'all go connect with him he drops so many nuggets on instagram go follow him and his church like they're doing such amazing things and expanding into new campuses and so truly this is a man that does god's work and you can trust every seed that you sow in and just Gosh, it's just going to be amazing just to see what the Lord brings 
I'm in for forever. I mean, you, you we're, I'm connected to you forever. I'm never going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Of course, of course. Appreciate you, Molly.